Welcome to the 700 Club. Concrete evidence. That's what Israel's prime minister says the IDF has uncovered on the grounds of the Shifa Hospital in Gaza. He says key terror leaders were hiding in the hospital and hostages were also held captive there. The Israeli military has recovered the bodies of two of those hostages. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has the details from Jerusalem. The Israel Defense Forces discovered an operational terror tunnel shaft on the grounds of the Shifa Hospital. Israel has been saying tunnels under the hospital are part of a Hamas terror command center. The White House also says U.S. intelligence shows Hamas was using the medical facility to protect a key command center. Hamas denies Israel's claims, but the Israeli military also says it found photos and videos of hostages on laptop computers in the Shifa hospital. They also discovered a booby-trapped vehicle containing a large amount of weapons. We found a vehicle filled with ammunition, uh, RPGs, AK-47s. We see handcuffs, knives. Preparation for taking hostages from Israel on the attack of 7, uh, October 7th. As you can see, they were very well prepared. And where they're hiding all of this equipment is in a hospital, a place that's supposed to be for humanitarian aid. They have all this evil hidden here. The State Department says it's because of Hamas strategy that it's difficult for Israel to avoid civilian casualties. Remember that it is Hamas that is putting all of these people in harm's way. It is Hamas that continues to operate inside hospitals as they have done inside mosques and schools and other civilian infrastructure. It is the Hamas that is at the root of all this problem. That is, that is creating such a difficult challenge for the international community and for the, the Israeli military. In an interview with CBS News, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says they have concrete evidence that terror chieftains were hiding in the hospital and fled when Israeli troops entered. He also said they believe the hostages were there. We had strong indications that they were held in the Shifa hospital, which is one of the reasons we uh, entered the hospital. Uh, if they were, they were taken out. We have intelligence about the hostages. But again, uh, as to your first question, I think the less I say about it, the better. The Israeli military saying it recovered the bodies of two hostages near the Shifa hospital. 65-year-old Yehudit Weiss, a mother of five whose husband was killed on October 7th, and IDF soldier Noah Marziano, also abducted on October 7th and murdered inside Gaza. President Biden is backing Israel's military operation, but also saying he discussed with Israelis their need to be incredibly careful in the Shifa hospital raid, and saying the fighting in Gaza would go on until Hamas was defeated. With regard to uh, when is this going to stop, I think it's going to stop when, the, uh, when Hamas no longer maintains the capacity to murder and abuse and and, uh, and just do uh, horrific things to uh, the Israelis. But there is a clear disagreement between the U.S. and Israel. Netanyahu says Israel will maintain security control over Gaza after the war is over to protect Israel. But Biden sees a different future, again supporting a Palestinian state, an idea not likely to be popular here in Israel. I made it clear to the Israelis that um, to Bibi and to his war cabinet, that I think the only ultimate answer here is a two-state solution that's real. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, with us now for more on what's happening in this war and what may come after is Jason Greenblatt. He was the White House special envoy to the Middle East under President Trump. Welcome to the 700 Club. Thank you for having me. Uh, what's your assessment of how Israel is handling the war? There seems to be a lot of critique, whether from the U.N. or from uh, other Arab nations. What, what's your take? Well, first of all, the U.N. has just about zero credibility when it comes to Israel. We've seen that over decades of, of uh, statements and resolutions coming out of the U.N. Uh, I think they're doing the best job that they possibly can when they're fighting an enemy who is embedded within civilian society, within civilian infrastructure, a terrorist group who cares nothing about human life, not Israelis, obviously, and even not Palestinians. So I think they're doing as good a job as they can under extraordinarily challenging circumstances.
Well, President Biden just asked for a, a two-state solution, which uh, I'm, I'm kind of amazing in the, amazed that in the middle of this, he, he's, he's saying that. Uh, my point of view is, uh, uh, frankly, an old one. The Arabs have never refused an opportunity to refuse an opportunity. So do you think there, that it's realistic to even talk about a two-state solution right now? No, I don't. And look, I think President Biden is doing a great job when it comes to defending Israel's rights. And uh, on the world stage, he's really done an excellent job. But when it comes to this, and there's some other criticism I have, certainly now is not the time to talk about any form of peace agreement. Two-state solution is not even a term I like to use because it's so vague. And there was polling released yesterday with a small sampling of Palestinians. But the, it, it's a very dismal poll, which shows that most Palestinians either support what happened on October 7, the atrocious barbaric attacks, or they want one state just themselves with no state of Israel. So the polling suggests that President Biden is way off on this. And regardless, it's going to take a long time to build trust and to assure Israel that something like this can never happen again. Well, I agree with you on the Biden administration, and I absolutely applaud just how strong they've been with the carrier groups and making it quite clear that the war should n never expand. Uh, I think that was part of the plot of Hamas. They were trying to uh, get Israel into an urban war, and then uh, I think they hoped Hezbollah would attack. So, but l let's look at something very specific. They extended, the Biden administration extended a waiver on Iran sanctions. And it could free up $10 billion. And the, the, my view is, Iran, it just gives them more money to spend on terrorism. Uh, what's your view of the White House policy on Iran? No, I agree. I mean, the, the failure to recognize that at the end of the day, the Iranian regime is the main source of trouble in the Middle East, not just Israel, of course, but they want to eradicate Israel, but all the other countries, unless the Biden administration is willing to confront Iran, not necessarily militarily. First, let's admit it. The Iranian regime is responsible here. And until they do that, we're just going to keep going through this cycle. What they're trying to do is take the temperature down. They're trying to protect Israel. All good. I, I respect that. I agree with it. I applaud it. But they're missing one key piece, which is their failure to recognize what the Iranian re regime is doing. And I think this release of funds is just going to give the Iranian regime a whole host of um, pockets to fill to foment terrorism against Israel, against our Arab allies, and really around the world. What, what's the long-term future of Gaza? I, I know that's a really broad question, uh, but uh, you know, there's a lot of, can Israel control it? Should Israel control it? Uh, should the UN get involved? Uh, what, what, in your view, is the best way forward for Gaza after the war? Well, first of all, if Israel is successful at rooting out Hamas, and, you know, it's a big if, but if they are, of course, that's much better for Israel, but it's also much better for the Palestinians living there. Prime Minister Netanyahu said Israel will have to have some form of overriding security control that is not to the liking of the Biden administration. But unless the Biden administration or others can assure Israel that there will be an alternate mechanism to make sure that Hamas 2.0 and 3.0 don't rise and create more October 7th, and otherwise attack Israel, I'm not sure that we have a choice. I don't think the UN can be trusted. I don't think they should be involved. But I would say that approaching our Arab friends and allies in the region, working together with Israel, maybe we could come up with a mechanism where Israel's presence is there, but not significantly so. The Arabs are helping to build and secure Gaza, and Palestinians could thrive and prosper unless, uh, until I should say, maybe there'll be a full-blown peace agreement with Israel down the road and then all Palestinians could thrive and prosper. But unless somebody could assure Israel that there'll be a mechanism in place to prevent what's happened, I don't know that anybody really has a choice. Well, you were one of the architects of the Abraham Accords, and I'm, I'm really encouraged to hear you say there could be an architecture for Gaza going forward. You, you wrote about creating the Abraham Accords in, in, in your book, In the Path of Abraham. I, I actually viewed the Abraham Accords as one of the prime targets of Hamas, that they launched this in order to stop Saudi Arabia. And I thought that the Accords would actually dissolve under the current war, but they've, they've held strong. So how do you think, what, what's the future here? Are, are the Arab nations going to say, we completely reject Hamas, Israel is part of our history, it will be part of our future? Uh, we want peace with Israel. Is, is that the end result of all of this? 
Well, I think we should applaud the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Morocco, who have stuck by the Abraham Accords. The UAE in particular has said some very strong statements after October 7 about the Abraham Accords. And yes, I believe they'll continue to stick with it. And I do think down the road, hopefully countries like Saudi Arabia and others will eventually be able to say publicly, but we all know their feeling, which is Hamas, the Iranian regime, terrorists funded and controlled by the Iranian regime, are all enemies of the region. And unless and until we root all of them out, and Saudi Arabia could continue with its plans, and the UAE and all these countries that have these amazing things going on, none of them are safe. Maybe a little bit more safe than Israel, but none of them are safe, while Hamas and the Iranian regime are running around in Hezbollah and the Houthi terrorists as well. Well, Jason Greenblatt, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for all your work for peace in the region. And, and I, I pray that, that your vi vision of Gaza in the future can actually come to pass. And I encourage you, keep speaking that, keep uh, speaking hope for this region. We need it now more Thank than ever. Thanks for having me. Well, first the walls started shaking, and then Yafim and his wife began shaking too. The terror of living under rocket fire scared their three-year-old daughter the most. She began to shut down, had trouble sleeping. Today, thanks to you, she and her family are calm and safe. The Iron Dome missiles exploded very close. Everything in the house was shaking. Yafim and his family live outside the mandatory evacuation zone near the Gaza border, but they quickly realized they were still in danger. One day there wasn't even a siren. We just heard the sound of rockets. And we stood in the corridor in the house. We didn't even manage to get out of the house. The walls started vibrating and we are vibrating too. We heard the sound of breaking glass. The missile hit our neighboring entrance. Community leaders encouraged them to leave. We didn't want to because we love our home. It's our home. It's hard to leave. It is unclear when all of this will end, when to wait, how long to wait. After weeks of heavy rocket bombardment and combat near their home, Yefim and his wife chose to go to Elat to rest. For a few days, we want a distraction because the atmosphere is oppressive. I see when the child is scared. The wife worries about everything. I had to do something, but you can't do anything. Thanks to support from donors like you, Yafim and his family are safe away from the fighting. Everyone is getting much needed rest, including their three-year-old daughter. She brings joy. She started to rejoice. Back in Ashkelon, she started to shut down. She had never been like this before. She always started to sleep like this. She sleeps here peacefully, her hands like this. It's quite here. Moral support is felt. Volunteers spend a lot of time with the child. Thank you very much because we're able to feel this world again where rockets and planes are not buzzing. It's, it's wonderful to see people being helped and being helped by you. If you want to be a part of it, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to contribute to CBN Israel. I want to help the evacuees. I want to help the people that have were, were underneath those rockets, uh, the aftermath of this horror of October 7th. And, and we're, we need to be with them, and we need to be with them long term. So if you want to be a part of that, give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to give to CBN Israel. You can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Just put CBN Israel on the memo line of a check. You can also go to CBN.com. When, when you uh, are on the donation page there, you can designate your gift to CBN Israel. You can also text CBN Israel to 71777. Do it now, 1-800-700-7000. One senator is single-handedly blocking all military promotions. Alabama's Tommy Tuberville said he'll continue to hold up the promotions unless the Pentagon changes its policy on abortion. As CBN Capitol Hill correspondent Matt Galka reports, some of Tuberville's fellow Republicans aren't hiding their frustrations. Some Republican senators say they agree with Tuberville that the policy needs to be changed, but that shouldn't mean hurting military personnel and their families. It punishes those brave service members who who didn't develop the policy and can't change it. We stand for life, but we also stand for other innocents, the innocent men and women who are serving in uniform today, continue to serve, 
without advancement in their career fields while their families are hanging in the balance. Senate Republicans went late into the night asking their fellow Republican Senator Tommy Tuberville to end his blockade on military promotions. The senator's objections have held up some 300 or so typically routine military promotions in the chamber. CBN spoke to Senator Tuberville this week about his ongoing effort. I hate to have to hold these people kind of a hostage, but the American people deserve better than this. They deserve an administration that's going to listen and go over the Constitution. The Alabama Republican has blocked the promotions for nine months, maintaining it's his only tool to push the Pentagon to change its policy of paying travel expenses for service members who cross state lines to get an abortion. Some of his fellow Republicans say he's taking the wrong approach. The policy is wrong, but holding these officers who had nothing to do this do with this is wrong. They deserve better. Alaska Republican Dan Sullivan led the all-night charge to try and get Tuberville to change his mind. I'm a Marine Colonel. You know, uh, these are some of the most pro-life families in America. I know that, right? The ones who are being held. So they're not just warriors. They're people who believe in the, you know, values that we're trying to move forward. And we're punishing them. Pro-life military heroes. I don't get it. Are you losing your own party on this? No, not, lo not losing your own party. I mean, we got a strong party. We got some people that look at this situation different. They think they would hope that we would move on with this to give give the 300 people a, a promotion. You got to remember, we're talking about a two million person military and 300 people. Uh, I keep hearing about how readiness. Okay, y'all tell me how I'm hurting readiness. Uh, the crickets, they can't tell you. The Senate Rules Committee voted this week along party lines for a rule change to go around Tuberville's blockade. Tuberville says he has the backing of some military personnel around the country and will continue to object until that rule comes to the floor. Listen, again, I'm a, I'm, I'm a team player, and I know we need a strong military, but we have to stand up in this country for what's right. There's a lot of other ways that we can try to reverse this policy, but punishing American heroes I don't think is one of them. If the resolution is brought to the floor, it would need 60 votes in order for the promotions to go through. But Tuberville's Republican colleagues would rather negotiate with him and get him to back off the blockade and get the Pentagon to change the policy in a different way, possibly the legal route. Tuberville told me earlier this week that a lawsuit is likely. Matt Gelkut, CBN News. All right. Thank you, Matt. Well, all this year, we've reported on moves of God on college campuses or in cities right here in the United States. Well, imagine evangelizing an entire country. Two American missions organizations, Shake the Nation's Ministry and Mountain Gateway, say they're following the Holy Spirit to do just that in Nicaragua. CBN's Mark Martin reports on the effort to reach hundreds of thousands of people with the gospel. The images tell an amazing story of Nicaraguans attending mass evangelism campaigns, witnessing the mighty move of God in their country. Missionary Britt Hancock of the organization Mountain Gateway followed God's call to help lead these events. And then he really spoke to me. Um, he told me, son, I, I, I've decided to do something in Nicaragua. And if you'll just say yes, you're going to watch me do something. And they most definitely have watched God do amazing things. Britt says close to a million people have attended the outreaches this year. He also says the government indicated the most recent ones brought in the largest gathering of people for an event in the country's history. And more than a dozen are planned for next year. In Jesus' name, by the end of next year, we will have evangelized an entire country. The country's got six million people in it. It's about the size of the state of Alabama in geographic size. We're just so grateful, you know, to Jesus and what he's doing and that he's allowing us to have a part. Britt says tens of thousands have accepted Jesus Christ and thousands have been healed. We've had people baptized in the Holy Spirit spontaneously. We've had people come out of wheelchairs. Every class of miracle, lame walking, deaf ears open. Blinded eyes open. 
Britt's wife, Audrey, also helps minister. It's amazing. It is overwhelming. And so when we when you stand up on the stage and you see all of these people coming and coming and coming, even on the way there, as you're driving, there's lines of buses, just bus after bus. And sometimes I look at Britt and go, wow, I'm so glad that we said yes to this. Britt describes it as a stirring of that whole society and offers this advice. Just say yes to Jesus, no matter what it is. Mark Martin, CBN News. Taking the biblical commission to go into all the nations. Gordon? Well, I hope your prayer after watching that is, here am I, send me. Whenever God tells you something, something to do, don't question it. Just say, okay, uh, if you're in it, then I want to be in it. I want to be where you are. In today's world, when you look at all the negative headlines, all the bad things that are happening, realize God always wants to raise up a standard. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he wants to raise a standard. So that's his will. That's what he wants to do. What he's looking for is, are you going to be in with that? When he says to you, will you stand up? Will you raise up? And the answer should always be yes. For Brett and Audrey, congratulations for saying yes. You then walk into the miracle power of God and you can change a whole nation. Let's do that. Let's do that, not just here in America, not just in Nicaragua, not just in South America, Latin America, Central America, North America. Let's do it all around the world. And that would change things. Let's say, Lord, here I am. Could you send me? Terry? for God's blessings, please remember the millions of people who need food, clean water, and medicine. Your compassion can help them right now when you give. Call now and let your love change a life this Thanksgiving. Well, here's another way you can touch a life. We want to invite you to join us in donating a special gift that's equal to the amount that you spend on your Thanksgiving meal. You're going to be helping people in need here at home as well as around the world. So just send your gift to Holiday of Hope, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Or you can call us at 1-800-700-7000. You can also go to CBN.com and give your gift online. Gordon? Well, there's a jersey at Ohio State that's awarded to one player every year. It's meant to recognize the teammate who best exemplifies the highest levels of toughness and character. Well, last year, the choice to wear that honor was an easy one. Cameron Babb, team captain. Will Dawson brings us his story. I told him I was done, and uh, I went in the locker room. Man, I was just crying. In 2018, Cameron Babb was one of the nation's best high school receivers. He'd accepted a full scholarship to play at Ohio State and dreamed of one day playing in the NFL. The hype was real, right? Yeah, yeah, it was real. Um, Sophomore, junior year is when you're getting offers from everybody in the country. Yeah. But at that point, too, you had to be thinking about the future. All right, I'm good enough that maybe someday the NFL could be a, a real possibility. Tell yeah. me about that. My whole identity really from a young age started to get wrapped up in being a football player. And so it was, okay, I'm gonna go to the NFL, that's gonna be my job, I don't wanna do anything else, but I just wanna play football. For Cam, the hype turned to heartbreak. In 2018, just one week before his high school season, he tore a ligament in his right knee and missed his final year. For a 17 year old, who again had his whole identity wrapped up in like, this is who I am, and without this I don't know, it was very hard. Nine months later, he still enrolled as a freshman wide receiver at Ohio State. His right knee was feeling great. Then the unexpected happened. I was doing really well, and then I just put my foot in the ground and uh, feel my left one give. So I'm out my whole freshman season. It was very humbling. The following season in 2020, Cam tore his left knee again. That's the breakup point. So I remember telling some of uh, like guys in the rooms, I was like, man, I'm done. Like I threw my helmet down, very frustrated, very like, like why again and again and again, I'm putting all this work, like nine to 12 months uh, of just putting not only my heart on the line, but my body, my knees. Cameron was no stranger to adversity. 
However, after his third knee surgery, he began questioning his role on the team. That's when he decided to pack up his bags and head home to St. Louis. That is, until he had an unlikely encounter with an Uber driver. I'm done with it. And so I talked to Coach Day, and I remember I was like, I just want to go home, go home and figure this stuff out. I Ubered to the airport, and Darnell, he was my Uber. He had the Bible on the stand. He reluctantly engaged the driver in conversation. I was in my own world, frustrated, mad, um, probably like cursing up a storm, like just talking to whoever I was talking to and telling him a little bit about myself. But then we pull up to the airport and he asked to pray. He was like, he's like, man, I, I really just feel like Jesus, like the Holy Spirit wants me to pray for you. And so we're in his car and he's like, man, can I, can I reach back and, and touch your knees? And I'm like, man, that's a little weird, but like, yeah, I mean, we can do it. Like we can do it. So he, uh, like he reclined his chair back and he put his hands on my knees. And uh, it was like right when he touched my knees um, and he, he opened his mouth. Like everything that he was saying was like spot on. Even the things that I didn't tell him was spot on. And it was at that moment, it was like the Holy Spirit was truly speaking through him in a way that he could never out of his own strength. And so I just started weeping, I started crying um, and really just start shaking uncontrollably. And I just met this man five minutes ago. And I remember there was a sense of peace and a sense of joy and a sense of happiness, if you want to say, in that moment, despite having just torn my ACL for the third time like a day ago, two days ago. And that is when, like, I was like, man, I don't know what that was, but I need more of it. Cam decided to stay in Ohio, and the driver invited him to church that Sunday. I remember I just got convicted by the Word of God, uh, Pastor Brian that goes there now, and I remember him just laying out the gospel for what it was. It took me 19 years to really hear like this gospel that changes hearts. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Like it changed my heart. With a new heart, Cam chose to stay with the Buckeyes where he began leading team Bible studies. In 2022, after a fourth knee surgery, Cam fought his way back again and was named team captain. On November 12th, 2022, he made his first collegiate catch a touchdown. And right when I turn my head, I just see CJ just rolling out and I just wait for him. And then uh, put my hands out and it kind of was almost like a, it was just like black. Like I don't even really remember it. I just remember getting right there and I fell down. Look up and, and I, I just, it was just, that was my worship. And I was thanking him, I was thanking him for all. I just looking back on all the moments where it was dark where I didn't think I could keep going. Um, and this is, I mean, obviously he's using me, but this is his story. Today, Cam is a speaker and volunteers with Man Up and Go, an organization that serves the fatherless. While his knees will keep him from playing in the NFL, Cam is keeping it all in perspective. If you go back, you look five years ago, before I came to that Uber, you wouldn't recognize the man that you see today. And it's all because of the Holy Spirit. It all points to Jesus and that's my goal. And so whether it's a church or business, young kids, whoever I can talk to, to tell them about the past five years, my whole life, the past 23 years of my life and, and showing them how Jesus has maneuvered and worked in amazing ways, that's my goal. But it's all to bring them to the knowledge of, of how his love truly is. By the grace of God, he, uh, he picked me up when I wasn't looking for him, when I wasn't thinking about him. And um, again, when I thought that I knew who Jesus Christ was, um, he showed me that I had no clue, and uh, he just invited me into his love. Let him invite you into his love. Let, let, let it happen. The invitation is for all to see, all to hear, his arms outstretched to, to say, yes, you're mine. I created you. I, I breathed you into being. For Cam, his identity was caught up in being a sports hero, being a premier athlete. He had the dream of the NFL, and that dream wasn't some pie in the sky. It was actually real. The hype was real. And with that came, this is my identity. And when that identity gets taken from you, well, now what do you do? For Cam, it was an Uber driver reaching back and saying, can I pray for you? For you right now, if your dreams are shattered, if you're wondering who you are, where you're going, I've got some really good news for you. You are a child of God. You come from God. 
Now I'll ask the question, where are you going? Are you going back to him? Are you going your own way? For Cam, he experienced something. And after that experience, he said, boy, I want more of that. I invite you today to do what the psalmist said, taste and see that the Lord is good. It is the experience that opens your eyes so that you can see and understand and then have that heart, boy, I want more of that. If you want this experience, because it is, we call it a born again experience, where once I was blind and now I see. If you want it, bow your head with me, pray a very simple prayer. God will hear it, he will understand it, and he will respond to it. Now, don't joke with God. The, the Bible's quite clear. When you seek me with all of your heart, then you'll find me. Don't do it jokingly. Don't do it as a pretend. But when you have your whole heart into it, that's when he answers. So let's pray. Jesus. That's right. Say his name. Say it out loud. Jesus. I come to you, and I want to know you. I want to have the experience of you. So, Lord God, come into my heart. Forgive me of anything I've ever done wrong. And let me know that you're real, that I can have a life with you, that you're not some faraway God, but you can be Emmanuel. You can be God with me, in me, all around me. Fill me with your love. Baptize me in your spirit, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Lord God Almighty, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask you fill them to overflowing and let them know how real you are. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. The Bible says that if you'll believe in your heart, then confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. So do that. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I prayed with that guy on TV. I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and he did, and I want to know more. And we've got that for you. It's called A New Day. In there is a teaching on, on how to live the Christian life, what do Christians believe, uh, how do you know your sins are forgiven? It's absolutely free. All you have to do is call us. We can send you a link to it, uh, or we can send you a, a, a CD with a booklet. It's your choice. You can get it either way. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Christmas displays have been canceled this year in the birthplace of Jesus. Local Palestinian authorities making that decision in honor of what they call Palestinian martyrs. Writing on Facebook, Bethlehem municipality crews announced the dismantling of Christian decorations installed several years ago in the city's neighborhoods and removing all festive appearances in honor of the martyrs and in solidarity with our people in Gaza. The post was later changed, removing the martyrs reference. A spokesperson told the London Telegraph that the traditional Christmas mass and prayers will still be held, but there will be no Christmas tree or lights in the city. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is providing life-changing surgeries for those in need around the world. Five years ago in India, 18-year-old Sania's life was turned upside down when she lost her parents in an accident. Afterwards, a health crisis in her own life. She developed a cataract, which eventually became so bad in both eyes, she was partially blind and dropped out of school, leaving her feeling hopeless. But she says she encountered God's love by participating in an Operation Blessing program that provides cataract repair surgeries through a partnership with healthcare facilities in India. A grateful Sania, who was spared from blindness, now wants to pursue her dream of becoming a doctor to help others. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting ob.org. 
The Thanksgiving season is a special time of gratitude for Caitlin Shaw. Six years ago, she made a miraculous comeback from a horrific freak accident. She also learned firsthand that God is real, God answers prayers, and God will never leave you nor forsake you. That particular day, it was, it was uh, pretty windy. And uh, I could actually hear some branches falling on the roof. And we heard just an explosion. It just rocked the whole house. It was mid-November 2017. John and Isila Shaw's family had just finished an early dinner. Afterward, their 14-year-old daughter, Caitlin, went to her room to take a nap. Without warning, a 100-foot-tall tree crashed into her bedroom. A neighbor came over to help as they searched frantically for Caitlin. All I saw was this tree completely filling the room. And the roof had, uh, of course, been crushed underneath it. And I can see just the sky behind it. It was raining and it was still windy. I ran in into the room and just tried to see if I can see her. I'm calling her name out and she's not responding to us. The tree was massive and too heavy to move. Finally, John spotted one of her legs. Finally found her, and but we couldn't see her head. And, and so I'm pulling her leg, she's not coming. I start pulling her arm, she's not coming. I'm pulling so hard, I feel like I'm gonna pull her arm right out of her socket, and, and I'm pulling with everything I got. And she's not moving, and her head is still pinched and just under the tree. It was scary because, you know, the trees, the branches everywhere. I thought she's gone you know, dead. All of a sudden, while I'm pulling on her, her arm, while I, she's sliding between my hands, I can't explain this, but all of a sudden she started shimmying out from under the tree. And it, it was just like, you know, almost like an aha moment. It, it was God it, it just intervening. Caitlin was unresponsive. They called 911 and took her to the living room where John began to pray. I just laid my hand on her head and said, Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I cast out the spirit of injury and death. And I began to see Jesus breathe into her. And right at that moment, all of a sudden, her, her chest began to rise and she started shaking. Her body started like, almost like she was having a seizure and she was just gasping for breath. And up to that moment, she wasn't moving, she wasn't breathing, nothing was going on, just laying there. EMTs arrived at the scene and Caitlin was transported to the hospital. John and Isilo followed close behind. They had her on life support. And I began to pray again. I began to put my hand on her, praying for a miracle of God. The Shawls started calling their friends and family and soon they had a prayer chain for Caitlin that stretched from there in Washington to Tennessee, all the way to Guam. I would figure there were probably hundreds, maybe even a few thousand people that were praying for my daughter. I say, God, give her another chance, please. After 18 hours, the doctors removed life support to see if Caitlin could breathe on her own. This is the moment of truth. Whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. They're gonna either pull her off and she's gonna somehow be hanging on still, or we're gonna end up letting her go. I was called to God and all of a sudden, they said, come back in. She's stabilized to a point. She's breathing on her own. It looks like she's fighting for her life. She's fighting on her, on her own. About 18 hours after they pulled the life support, she's semi-stabilized. She's breathing on her own. And about six hours later, this is like slightly less than 24 hours, she actually stood up and was walking down the hall with the support of the hospital staff. Caitlin's nurse shared her story with other members of the medical team. He says, I know I'm not supposed to necessarily share names and all that, but there's a young girl named, named Caitlin, and I'm, I'm taking care of her. And, and we have a walking miracle in our hospital here today. Caitlin recovered quickly and within days of her traumatic experience was released from the hospital. Here it was Friday and Sunday we're in church. She's in church with us.
It was almost surreal, and there was such a, an excitement in the congregation. Two weeks after Caitlin's miracle, the Shaw family celebrated Thanksgiving with hearts full of gratitude. I knew a lot of people were praying for me, and I felt very thankful for them. I would really thank God for bringing us all back together, you know, and for Thanksgiving. That's really special for us. There was just such a sense of gratitude and, and thankfulness. That opportunity just to have a continuation of her being with us and, and God never left us or forsook us in, in the midst of all that trial. This experience has changed Caitlin's view of God. I started to actually like believe in him because like he saved my life and if it wasn't for him, I would like, would it be here? God is real. God answered my prayers. He never leave you or forsake you. There, there's still that soft spot in our heart of just thankfulness and, and gratitude to God because in the midst of just devastation and broken pieces, and he just sustained us. And we're just so thankful that he's carried us through. You know, I think what Caitlin said is really true. Sometimes we come into faith, it's almost like we inherit it, we're raised in it, and, you know, we accept that God is there, but do we really believe him? Do we really acknowledge that he is who he says he is, capable, able, seeing us, loving us, wanting to intervene right in the midst of our need? Sometimes it takes a moment an issue like Caitlin and her family went through where God becomes so real, so life-changing. You don't have to wait for a moment like that. He is who he says he is. And because of that, we know we can call upon his name. He hears us, he sees us, he knows us, and he wants to be a part of our lives. We want to take some time to, today to pray for you. I don't know what you're going through, but I know we all have things in our lives that we're saying, God, Show me, teach me, touch me, use me. This is Audrey. She wrote in by email and said, A couple weeks back, I turned on the TV to watch CBN. At the end of the show, Gordon started praying for someone with a right knee problem. That was me. My knee had started giving me trouble. It worried me, and it was painful to go upstairs. Just before sitting in front of the TV, I had put a pain patch on. When Gordon finished praying, I declared I was claiming that word and stripped off the patch. I am healed in Jesus' name. I've been able to climb up and down stairs with no problem. I thank you, Jesus, for the power in your name and in your word. We rejoice with you, Audrey. That's wonderful. Yeah. Here's Ernest from Los Angeles. Terry had a word of knowledge concerning high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Ernest grabbed it big time. I love that. Grabbed it big time and said, that's mine. He snatched his healing knowing that the word was for him. No more headaches at night when he lies down to go to sleep. No more spinning rooms if he moves too quickly one way or another. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. You can literally snatch your healing. When you see Caitlin's miracle, her father said, I come against the spirit of injury and of death. I claim my daughter. I will snatch her from death and bring her back into life. When you hear Audrey say, I heard this prayer for her knees, I claimed it. It was for me. I stripped off that pain patch. I climbed the stairs and the healing became mine. When Ernest hears a word about high blood pressure, he said, that's mine. I am snatching it. I am claiming it. What was the first sermon of Jesus? You find it in Mark chapter 1, very first chapter. The time is fulfilled. That means now. The time is fulfilled right now. The kingdom of God is at hand. That means it's right here. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is when God's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven. In heaven, there's nobody traumatized. There's nobody injured. There's nobody with high blood pressure. There's nobody with problems with their knees. There is no more death or pain or sorrow. That's God's will. Now, how do you get that? The time is now. The kingdom of, of heaven is at hand right here. You can reach up and grab it. Change your 
thinking and believe the good news. Stop believing the symptom. Stop believing the diagnosis. Believe that by his stripes you were healed. He is able. He is all-powerful. He wants to. Reach up and grab it right now. Now, here's the word you grab. you find it from Psalm 103. Mm. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Let your disease be part of that all. Claim it. Grab it. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, for everyone right now who is believing and reaching up to grab their healing, we come into agreement right now, touching it. We say over them out loud, be healed and be made whole. May my body from the top of my head to the soles of my feet be healed and restored right now. Terry, God's given you. Yes, someone, you've, um, you've had a break in your right wrist and the forearm, and it was a serious break, and you have some... Um, just recurring discomfort there and the lack this is your dominant arm and a lack of mobility god's healing that for you i mean restoring it back to what it was before you ever had that someone else you have issues with your stomach um pretty serious issues it has to do with the absorption of things in your stomach god's healing your stomach for you just put your hand right there and begin to praise him and thank him for it uh, there's someone you heard the word about the right wrist and say, please say left wrist. And so I'm saying left wrist for you. And, and the, the, may, may you be amazed at how flexible the God is going. He's going to restore it fully, full movement, full capacity right now. Someone say, please say knees again. So I'm saying knees just for you. Someone else is saying, please say cancer. And so in the name of Jesus, may cancer leave your body right now. Someone else, you've got some kind of brain infection. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I don't know what, what the cause is, but God does, and you do. And God is healing you right now. Many people are getting their memory restored right now. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. If you've been healed and touched, call us. If you need prayer, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Psalm 9. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell all your wonderful deeds. 